House will come back to order. Uh, clearly, there were those who uh, wished to speak who didn't quite make uh, getting their, uh, their names to my attention before I called for the vote. We understand that there are people who want to discuss this Im Im important uh, uh, bill. And if there is no objection, I'd be quite happy to clear the board and continue with debate. Is there objection? Is there objection? Hearing none, the board will be cleared, and we will go back to uh, the debate. Please come back to order. Your mark further on the bill is amended. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The bill before us this evening is no doubt a very complicated bill. In fact, uh, I think it's 16 pages long. And uh, I got my first look at it yesterday. And I took a uh, considerable amount of time to go paragraph by paragraph, so I had a good understanding of what was happening here. But more importantly, this is just the second step in what I consider to be a three-step process. The first step was the governor's executive orders establishing what are referred to as majority representatives, which are the unions. Mr. Speaker, could I have a little silence in the chamber, please? Gentleman has asked for quiet. Could you please... Uh Provided. Thank you. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that. I'm trying to keep my thoughts collected here. The first step in this process was the establishment of the majority representatives through uh, Governor Malloy's executive orders number 9 and 10. Um, for the benefit of the chamber, the majority representatives essentially are the unions that would represent daycare providers in executive order number 9 and personal care attendance in executive order number 10. That process has occurred. The governor's executive orders laid out the plan for the process of the unions to uh, become the bargaining units through an election process laid out within those executive orders. And this legislation that's before us takes the next step, which is to provide those uh, bargaining units with recognition by the state and also the ability to collectively bargain. And this particular bill lays out the third step, which would be a vote on a collective bargaining agreement, which would ultimately go into effect. I'd like to ask the proponent of the bill a few questions with, regarding, uh, with regard to how we got here, if I may, uh, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Please prepare yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I guess that's my first question. I would like uh, uh, the proponent of the bill, if you would be so kind, uh, to let us know exactly we, how we got to this point where we have majority representatives uh, in place who are going to be granted, if this bill uh, should pass, collective bargaining power with the state of Connecticut. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, yes. The executive orders did two things. They created two working groups to study and recommend how a collective bargaining process would best work in these two unique types of workforces. And second, they set up a meet and confer process to allow workers to elect a majority representative group to talk to the administration, but no right to negotiate any changes. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you for that answer. Uh, can I ask also through you, Mr. Speaker, if the executive orders also contained one other item, and that is the process for the elections that put each majority representative for each body, the daycare providers, and the PCAs in place. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zelaski. Through you, Mr. Speaker. I don't have the executive orders in front of me, but I know 
that AAA did the election through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I can assure everyone in this chamber that the executive orders it did, in fact, lay out the process for the election that put the majority representatives ultimately in place so that they could be before us in this bill looking for collective bargaining rights. I'd also remind the chamber that this same exact legislation that the executive orders covered, including the election process, uh, was proposed uh, in the Connecticut General Assembly three times in, this, in the, uh, that I'm aware of, anyway, maybe possibly even more than that, within recent years, three times. And each time, it failed to pass for a vote. This most recent time, the governor took it upon himself to begin the process by establishing the two majority representatives we just spoke about via executive order. I'm wondering if the proponent of the bill feels that, like I do, that that election process should be something that the legislature should have had an opportunity to vote on. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Through you, Mr. Speaker. No, I do not. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that answer. Uh, and the reason why I ask is I, I, I think it's something I want to make clear that regardless of our political stripes in here, I think that each one of us needs to pay very close attention to what happened with these executive orders. This is an instance where the executive branch stepped over its boundaries laid out in our Constitution to make law without our consent. And the very fact that this has been attempted numerous times by this body should be clear evidence that it needed to. And I would be shocked that anyone would think that the governor should have the authority, regardless of what political party they're from, to make law without the consent of this body. And I would say that the executive orders containing the process to establish a majority representative, a union election, in fact, uh, certainly uh, covers that. So I'll move on to the bill. I said my piece about that. I'll also make a note that there are two pending lawsuits uh, against the governor for that exact issue, exceeding his executive authority and also some of the provisions provided in the executive orders, I think in my mind are clear violations of national and state labor law. I think it's also interesting that we are attempting to pass the next step in this process via this legislation when these lawsuits are pending. And I think if you look around the country, you'll see that this process has been attempted in numerous states. And in the states where there has been objections by folks saying that the governors in those respective states did not have that authority, and they were able to mount a legal challenge up front and through vigorous effort, that effort to put the unionization into effect has failed. It is only in the cases where it happened quickly and without a vigorous opposition that it has succeeded. And I am confident that in Connecticut we are going to be in the former situation and that the executive orders will be overturned and this legislation, regardless of it passes, will end up being moot. The governor has repeatedly stated that the executive orders that established the majority representatives were not binding in any way. So I have a question, Mr. Speaker, for the proponent. The question, Steve. I'm sorry, the question, Mr. Speaker, is does this legislation before us not require that the majority representatives, the unions, are already in place before this legislation can take effect? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, uh, from my understanding, uh, the unions are their representatives. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that because that will no doubt help my legal case to make the point that you needed to have these majority representatives before this legislation can take effect, and the executive orders, in fact, uh, did do that. So given that, I want to talk directly about the language contained in the bill. 
In section two, uh, lines 12 through 16, it says that uh, a family child care provider shall not be considered a state employee. But in fact, this bill essentially sets up a situation where the family child care providers are going to bargain with the state. Don't employees in most union situations bargain with their employer? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, Mr. Speaker, in this case, they, uh, they don't, they are being paid by the state. So being that they are paid by the state, that's why they set this system up through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the following section, it, it, uh, there's a notation that family child care providers shall have the right to bargain collectively and have, shall have such other rights. Through you, Mr. Speaker, what are those other rights? Representative Zalaski. The other rights could be many different things uh, to the, uh, uh, I would say, rights as uh, when it comes to uh, deciding who they, uh, what classes they may take or what education they may take through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Forgive me, I don't know if that's uh, what is uh, meant by such other rights, but uh, I guess we'll, we'll leave it like that because apparently I don't think either one of us are, are quite certain what might else be there. That doesn't mean that uh, there isn't something. I, I, let me move on to the next section, which I found troubling because Several times I have heard from proponents of this legislation that child care providers and PCAs are going to benefit greatly from this unionization in things other than, uh, you know, uh, monetary compensation and that uh, other things would become available to them, health benefits and so forth. But Section 2-1, uh, section, uh, lines 22 through 27, lays out very simply, the following shall be prohibited subjects of bargaining the application of state employee benefits to family child care providers, including but not limited to, and the very first thing that's mentioned is health benefits. I wonder if the uh, proponent of the bill can speak to how the members of the union that have been established are going to benefit um, as far as health benefits given this language within the bill. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zalaski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, number one, I, I don't speak for the, the members. They get to decide which benefits they may uh, uh, anticipate they would like. But I would say that, number one, the bill stipulates that they can't take this, the uh, state benefit health care plan. Maybe they'll have their own type of health care plan like I have at my shop. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So. If, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, this section pertains only to whether or not these um, uh, members of the union are going to be able to benefit from state employee benefits. Is that correct, Mr. Speaker? Representative Zalaski. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Section 22 through 27 prohibits any bargaining proposal that would interfere with a parent's right to select, hire, fire, and direct the providers of their choice also prohibits grievance arbitration against any parent, guardian, and any proposal that gives family care, child care workers, state employee benefits. Representative Sampson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I'm speaking just about lines 22 through 24 in the bill, where it says the following shall be prohibited subjects of bargaining, and health benefits is listed. Do you, Mr. Speaker, that's correct. So, just to be very clear, Members of the union, the two unions, are not going to be eligible for state employee health benefits or any of the other items mentioned in that same paragraph. Is that correct through you, Mr. Speaker? I'm Zadlowski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, that is correct. All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that answer. In... Uh, Section 5D, I think it's line starting 67. This is where uh, the Department of Social Services uh, becomes the executive branch employer representing family child care providers. 
And it states that in this section that they will be the exclusive bargaining agent for family child care providers in Connecticut. Through you, Mr. Speaker, does this mean that family child care providers, if they choose to collectively bargain in some other way or even uh, group together uh, as an association to maybe lobby the legislature for additional funding for Care for Kids, something like that, would that prohibit that activity by stating, as it does in this bill, that DSS will be the exclusive bargaining agent through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Zalaski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, DSS, Department of Social Services, is the one that pays these providers through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. Can you repeat that again? Representative Zalaski. <clears throat> yes, through you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, social Services, Department of Social Services is the one that provides the payment to these workers through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The way I understand the process is that daycare providers in Connecticut are typically uh, self-employed small business owners, and that the payment that we're referring to may end up in their hands, but it is not for them. It is for a subsidy given to a parent of a child that has applied for Care for Kids benefits. I'm wondering how if these people are self-employed business owners, how we could be putting them, treating them essentially as employees of someone else, and specifically in this paragraph, the Department of Social Service. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, again, Care for Kids receive their payment from Department of Social Services. Representative Sampson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I don't know if that answers my question. What I'm, what I'm saying is that the, the people that are ultimately receiving the check are small business owners. They are not employees of the state. Yet we are putting them essentially into a state employee union and asking that they bargain with the state for the amount of that Care for Kids subsidy, even though the Care for Kids subsidy is for a parent uh, of a child that might visit that small business. I'm trying to understand the logic behind how we are treating one person who is a small business owner as if they're an employee of someone else for a check that doesn't benefit them. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Celeste. Through you, Mr. Speaker. The check goes directly to the provider. Representative Sampson. Through you, Mr. Speaker. So, the, the, so what I'm being told is that because they are the ultimate recipient of the check, they should be considered an employee of the state. Is that correct, Mr. Speaker? Representative Celeste. Through you, Mr. Speaker. As you read in the bill, that they are not employees of the state. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If they are not employees of the state, who does the bargaining unit negotiate with other than the state? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zalaski. Through you, Mr. Speaker. They do negotiate with the state. They negotiate with the Secretary of OPM. And then the negotiations are conducted by the Office of Labor Relations, which is a, which occurs in all bargaining with state employees. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the whole problem I'm having with this thing, is it seems that we want to have this both ways. In some respects, we're saying that these people are not state employees, so they're not eligible for benefits of state employees. But another way, we're saying that because they have to negotiate with the state, they are state employees, and we're going to set up essentially a shell organization because, in fact, these people are self-employed businesses. They do not work for anyone else. So we're going to say that they work for this imaginary organization. In the case of the uh, PCAs, we're setting up the Personal Care Attendance Workforce Council. And in the case of the daycare workers, I guess it's the DSS that ultimately ends up being their pseudo-employer. Employer. It just seems to me that in every other circumstances I could ever imagine in the case of a union, it is the employees are unionizing to negotiate with their employer. So I'm trying to get as much clarification as I can on who employs these self-employed business people in the case of the daycare providers. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zalaski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, in this bill, it says that the state pays them. Uh, I know where I work at my shop, the person that pays me is my employer. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to move on to uh, uh, PCAs for a minute because we have a very similar situation there, and that is in line 157, it says consumer. Consumer means a person who receives services from a personal care attendant under a state-funded program. And I take this to mean, like in most cases, the, uh, the consumer, I would assume from this paragraph and the wording, is, is maybe a disabled person, for instance, that hires a PCA to help uh, uh, take care of their, uh, you know, their daily business, that sort of thing. Is this consumer the same thing as the employer? Through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Zalaski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, the consumer gets to hire and fire their uh, and clients, but they receive their checks, the money from the state. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm just trying to follow. So the consumer, can we, can I, Mr. Speaker, can we, uh, through the, to the proponent, can we call this consumer the employer, seeing how the personal care attendant works for them? Through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Zaleski. Yes, I guess you could, through you, right. Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If that's the case, then why are the PCAs not negotiating with their employer, who we just established is the disabled person, and instead negotiating with the state for their benefits? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, because they receive their benefits, their, their money from the state. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The way I understand it is that the PCA ultimately receives a payment, but that payment is from the disabled person who we're referring to as a consumer, and we both agreed is their actual employer. And there are several references in this bill that would absolutely prove that they are, without anybody's doubt, the, uh, the true employer. Section 4-3, which is lines 174 to 176, says, personal care attendance means persons employed by a consumer. I mean, you know, if you're employed by someone, I'm assuming you're employed by your employer. So I want to thank you for your uh, upfront response in saying these people are actually the employer. And this is, this is the, the major issue I have with this bill more than any other thing, is that we are trying to play games with who employs who here. And we're blurring the lines based on the way money uh, circulates through the system. The fact is that in the daycare side, the state does not trust the parent of the child to spend the money on the daycare, so they send it to the daycare provider directly. But does that make the daycare provider an employee of the state? No, not in any way, shape, or form. In fact, they're a small business owner and they can charge whatever they want to their consumers. If they want to charge $200 or $150 for a day's worth of daycare, they can choose to do that. And if the subsidy is a certain amount, that gets deducted from that. But we're going to create a bill that essentially has these people put into a union that is going to negotiate the amount of that subsidy on their behalf. That subsidy shouldn't matter that much to them. The amount that matters to them is the amount they charge their uh, customer. The amount of the subsidy is something that should matter to the parent. And in the case of the PCAs, it's a very similar situation. We just established that it's the disabled person who is the actual employer, and the person that uh, is taking care of them, the PCA, receives their payment from that employer, and it's because the disabled person receives a Medicaid waiver rather than being in some sort of institution they get this benefit. It just so happens that they pass that money on to the PCA, but their employer is the disabled person, and the beneficiary of the money is the disabled person and not the PCA. Yet we are going to put the PCAs in the union as if they are employees of the state. It seems very fishy to me. I'm going to move on just briefly here. And I want to ask a couple of questions about the dues. We got into this a little bit on the amendment. Mr. Speaker, through you, I would like to ask the proponent how dues are going to be collected with uh, respect to daycare providers. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, they will be deducted from the funds that they send to the provider. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let me pose a couple of instances to you. If there's a certain amount that is deducted from the Care for Kids subsidy, which I hate to be redundant, but I want to point out is not for the daycare provider. They're just the ultimate recipient of the money. If they have five kids that are in the Care for Kids program, and the daycare down the street only has two kids, I'm going to assume that the person that has the five kids actually has more 
dues being taken out of their Care for Kids check than the other one. Do, does the one that's paying more in dues have more rights than the other within the union? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, no. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You said during the uh, amendment that you become a member of the union the first time you receive a Care for Kids subsidy. Can I ask if there is ever a point where you cease becoming a member of the union? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, yes, when you don't receive any checks from the state. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, you may not receive checks from the state for some period of time. For instance, you may have, uh, as the owner-operator of your own small business as a daycare operator, you might have a Care for Kids subsidized child within your daycare at one point, and then you may not for some period of time. Who knows? It might be a week or a year. If it happens a year after the first time, I'm assuming that the uh, subsidy will be taken out that very, very next time it happens. Is that correct? I'm sorry, the dues would be taken out of the check the next time. Is that true, Mr. Speaker? Representative Zaleski. Through you, Mr. Speaker, again, if the employees have negotiated that there is a due structure, yes, they will. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to remind uh, everyone that we just passed an amendment that established that we statutorily decided that they get a 60-day uh, getting your feet wet period. And that was had nothing to do with the determination of the union after an election. So I just want to ask again, if you are essentially you have your first care for kids check comes in, you're not responsible on the 60th day, and there, we've already established through many of the questions on the amendment that there are numerous circumstances where you might have a care for kids child for one day and then not have another one until the 61st day. And we're not really sure what's going to happen. But assuming that you have a care for kids uh, child in your daycare today and you don't have another one for a year you've obviously met that 60-day threshold so a year later you get another care for kids uh, person in your daycare would the dues be taken out through you mr. speaker representative Zaleski through you mr. speaker I would guess under your scenario you would Representative Sampson. I'm, I'm sorry you said you would or you wouldn't representative Zaleski through you mr. speaker if you receive funds from the state you have to pay dues if the union membership decides so Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, the point I'm trying to make is that, as far as I can tell, once you are in this union by taking a Care for Kids check, is that I think that you are in this union forever. Let me ask about the uh, PCAs uh, briefly, and that is, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the proponent how dues would be collected in the case of personal care attendance? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Yes, Mr. Speaker, uh, through you. PCAs are uh, paid by a, f a fiscal agent on behalf of the consumer. Money comes from the state through you. So, so it would come out of that check. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, so uh, if I understand the proponent correctly, the elderly person, the consumer who we established is the true employer, receives a check and pays the PCA from that check the amount that they've agreed to pay them. I'm wondering where the dues comes into the equation. The, are the dues taken out of the check that goes to the consumer, employer, elderly person or disabled person? or is it taken out by them before it gets to the PCA? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. The check actually goes to the worker themselves. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand there's this organization called Allied, which essentially directs the payments from the consumer slash employer to the PCA. Are they the ones taking out the dues? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Through you, Mr. Speaker, I would guess that is true. Representative Sampson. So let me just follow up with more or less the same question, which is, suppose I am a disabled person, a consumer slash employer, and I hire a personal care attendant, and they work for me for a short period of time. Once the 60 days threshold is met 
they will be responsible uh, for paying dues, and that those dues would be taken out of the check that goes directly to the PCA per my request by Allied. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Zaleski. Through you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, the membership has to vote to set up a due structure, and they have to get their first contract. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm through with my questions for the proponent. If uh, he wants to grab a break and take a seat. Thank you thank very you, much, sir. Mr. Speaker. And on behalf of a representative, thank you. Mr. Lesky, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. I just, I just want to end by saying that uh, I ran for office for, for one very simple reason. I mean, obviously, we all have our own reasons for wanting to be involved and uh, work for our communities and so forth. But my biggest one is that I want to make sure that the individual liberties that are guaranteed to each of us in our uh, state and U.S. constitutions are protected. And this is why I'm so adamantly against this bill. I feel that the uh, governor um, essentially overstepped his bounds, and I'm not going to hammer this issue to death anymore, I promise you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, but essentially put in a process without the consent of the legislature, the people's representatives, which is why I said I think we should all be concerned about it regardless of whether we are Democrats or Republicans. And that process essentially set up a situation where many people's voice was not heard. I kept hearing tonight how we were concerned about how people's voices were heard and they needed to have their voice heard by the legislature as far as how much Care for Kids money comes and so forth. All that needs to happen is they need to ask and this legislature needs to act. We do not need to establish uh, a union uh, majority representative to negotiate with the state on behalf of private citizens, uh, individuals that run their own small businesses. Because when we do that, we are negating all of the people who do not choose to be part of this. And those are the people I'm speaking for. There are some people that probably want the union to exist, and I think they should absolutely have that option. But I would feel a lot better about it if it came from them. The fact is that this process is occurring in many, many states throughout our country, and in every case it is not happening because daycare providers or PCAs are suddenly banding together, deciding that they need to unionize to lobby their states for more funding. It is happening because of a concerted effort from uh, a top-down uh, uh, initiative to create more dues-paying members. Ultimately, the people involved didn't ask for this, and as a result, I urge my colleagues to oppose this legislation, and if they, people involved, the daycare providers and the PCAs want to unionize, let their voices be heard and not the governor's voice or this legislative body's voice. Let those people ask us first. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, sir. Gentleman from the 144th, Representative Mulgano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good evening.